Bom, 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 bom. Bom, 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 bom. Hello and welcome to part 14 of 14. A summary and a little more of Edward I's attempts to conquer by civil engineering North Wales. And it really is North Wales. Now, I'm going to have some slides going behind me because, frankly, I almost feel, well, to be honest, I do feel pretty much like I'm not doing a presentation at all, or talking at all, if I don't have some form of slides going. So, there they are. But they'd be on a faster rotation than normal because there's a about a dozen of them, and this should be about half an hour long. So, the maritime origins and the sea power behind the ring of iron. Stone, as I was taught it. It's always fun when you start going into things and people go, Are you sure? Rather random discussion, but it's always fun when you start challenging what would seem like the obvious conclusion. Castles, they're about land power. But, in this case, they're very much about sea power. In fact, many castles are about maritime power. But they're also about land power. Which leads you to a very interesting idea. And I'm going to sit up, because it needs to be sit up. What happens if there is no such thing as maritime power or land power? What happens if there's just the power to influence events or not to influence events? What happens if the concept that we use where we divide these things up into different realms and go that's air power, space power, cyber, this, that, other things, they might be areas of competency but they aren't areas of individuality because in the end what matters is the combined product the combined creation the ultimate production because that's what these castles are about really these castles are about providing stability in a civil power state peace civil uh, civil power but to do that, they depend upon psychology, psychology by being these massive statements of intent and power, these visible presence, the military power of the garrison, its ability to defend the castle, but also its ability to patrol and support operations in the wider area. And especially in terms of the constables and other bailiffs and other officers based in those castles. Sea power, both in terms of their security, their supply, their creation, but also in terms of what they provide, because those castles in turn provide secure ports for sea power. Flint, Hawarden, Rufflin, Bilf, Aberystwyth, Denby, Carnarvon, Conway, Halleck and Bomaris. All of them not only provide and are dependent upon sea power in to an extent or a great a lesser or greater extent but all to an extent but all also support sea power by providing safe places, safe harbors for the fleet to organize itself. Logistics. Yes. This is a spot which we can supply by sea, but it's also a spot where we can stockpile supplies for operations by from the sea. I am a naval historian. I teach engineering history. And this has been me talking about castles, which is land history, military history, more often than not. It's considered. But 
those are labels. And those are lovely labels, they're necessary labels in some respects because they make life easier, make it easier for you to find down someone whose perspective or whose orientation on looking at something comes from the avenue that you'll want to look for. But a naval historian who knows nothing about the land power in the operations or theatres they're looking at on the air power involved and the other things which are involved, the command, the civil, uh, civil structure, the various politics going on, he's probably very poor at their job. Now, I have to admit, there are specific periods of military history where I tend to avoid the French internal politics if I can. Because French internal politics is one of those things which I just find they're always going, they're changing this one, that one, this one, that one, this one, that one. And it's like watching a tennis match. But the moment I am actually writing something on that period and doing something properly on that period, where I need more than a surface understanding of their politics, I will go and do the research. I will go and find the books. And I'll be confused, but I'll make sure I have studied enough, no, enough that I understand it. Usually I'm more, enough, I'm more often confused about how to pronounce the names than the actual politics. It's the same when I hear people talking about castles and they focus in on the castle itself and they're going it's all about this castle and this setting and it's this pattern and you sort of go lovely but you haven't looked at who's constructing it why they're constructing it and if you go with some very good castles and especially the better tour guides when you get a really good, usually in my experience, they're volunteers, expert on their castle who are giving you the guide. They will go into everything. They will give you the full context, all the subtext, all the history of the builder, why they were building, who the, what sort of conflicts were going on at the time, why they've picked this location. Because if I'm a lord who's a very powerful lord, I've got lots of estates nearby and lots of people, but I have to, I'm picking a site for a castle. Well, here's the thing. My criteria are going to be different than, let's say, King Edward's criteria. King Edward has a fleet to call on. He can call on the sink ports. He can, he can charter ships quite easily. Most lords can if they are of a certain level of finance. They can also charter ships. But if I'm a low level lord, can I? The nicest way if I'm a lower level lord, if I'm just a sort of a senior knight or something building a castle, how much money do I have in the first place? But also what are my likely threats? The castles a king is going to build, well, they're likely to face off against large armies or large forces at some point. That's what you're building them for. Because at some point, they might well be facing the full might, in the case of Bomaris, of the Scottish army or of a Scottish army. A significant fighting force. If I'm a powerful duke or earl, Again, my castles might face off against significant forces, even internal forces, because there might be other earls, again, as we discussed in the books and various our histories, other earls might well make a play to seize my lands by force, rather than going with the law, especially if they perceive the king as being weak. This is the thing. When the king is perceived as weak, that is when you need your castles to be really strong, because that's when other people are likely to try and take them by force, because the king isn't going to do anything. Because ultimately, the threat on a very powerful magnate is the king, or queen, who has can call on a wide array of forces. Either their own army they can raise, or other earls who will come and do their enforcement for them.
because it works well for them to keep the king or queen happy. So that's a level of castle. Bamaris, Carnarvon, they are both arguably as much palace as they are castle, but that makes sense. These are royal castles. These are about a statement of intent from the king. They are about the king's power. Which means they are as much about soft power as they are about hard power. They are much as about maritime power because the king, the king, resupplying by sea is a sensible, likely opportunity. It is a sensible product from the size of army he's likely to be deploying. In fact, if you look at any of the major operations that are conducted in this period, they usually contain a hefty maritime component because the roads are terrible and no one wants to move a lot of stuff by them if they can avoid it. So, of course, castles, royal castles especially, are going to have a maritime influence on them. You know, uh, this is nothing surprising. The other key thing, I think, is about who is building your castle. So, if you have the power to employ someone like Master James of St. George, You are employing one of the greatest minds of his generation. You are employing also one of the best architects of his generation. That is going to produce a different castle than if you employ Joe Bloggs. I, you employ a local stonemason who has never built a castle before. There's going to be a difference. One of the interesting things about castle construction is that you do start to get low to medium level nobility, especially second sons, who are known for their fighting, also go into castle construction and try and train to become masters. Because if you are a master castle constructor, you are likely going to get a constableship or something else and put in charge or maybe even a governorship or a sheriffship of a castle of a large area from the crown, which gives you some income, it gives you a role, a status, and employment in peacetime. And it's something which you can turn into a lucrative career. Because you do it well, you might get another more important one, or confirmed in post. Think Castle is a especially cool example one. So, those are the factors in castle design. Castles are complicated, be uh, complicated machines. And I want to emphasize that a castle is a machine. It might not be what you might traditionally consider a machine, but it is a machine. It's a machine of war. It is a machine which is designed to maximize the garrison's ability to hold the area the castle dominates. That is not just the footprint of the castle. That is the area within sight ride of the castle. Again, when you see the, hear the garrison numbers, and I'm talking about the garrisons, another reason these castles were often built connecting towns, as I said, because that gave you access to a local militia. It gave you extra defence in depth. It gave you extra eyes and ears in the area. This matters. We talk about one of the more famous instances on these castles, is one of them falling to two men pretending to be carpenters. That is a failure of intelligence on 
two levels. One, the local community had not heard and told the garrison that their things were getting iffy in the area so they needed to be on alert. Two, the garrison wasn't really on alert. It's not the castle's fault. It's the garrison. But the castle is obviously not working for the garrison, or the garrison aren't working as it's supposed to be in the castle, in that this hasn't been picked up on. Which adds another point into this. The castles. They are one part of the equation in terms of power in their area. You can build the finest, most perfect castle you have ever imagined. It could be Beaumaris, built a pot of, um, a, a high up on top of a mountain with the sea on three sides, town halfway down the mountain on a sort of plateau, and then another drop down before you get to the level at which everyone will have to approach up. So they'll have to fight up through two lines of town and all the way up through uh, through concentric castle to get to the keep. That is, you know, that could be the ultimate castle. It could have its own access to the sea through a gate out of the cliff and a, a dock out of the cliff onto the sea. But, even that amazing theoretical castle could fall if the garrison is not paying attention. You can have all the sea power, you can have all the engineering you can possibly get, but your garrison doesn't work, you're in trouble. So, that's the real problem. It's very rare in history that castles are badly designed to the point at which they fail through pure and simply bad design. Even the Joe Bloggs built castles. For castles which are built by the masters, if you look at them, and this includes star forts and all the other beautiful things that are being constructed through history as variations on these fortified places, they tend to fail when they fail through this. Squidgy humans. It's the constant in history. We are able to build better machines then we are able to be humans. Or rather, perhaps, because we are human, that is where our frailty comes from. And our castle's frailty. So, here is the question. How do you design a castle and design into a castle the ability to minimise the garrison's ability to be human. And this is the really interesting thing with the Master James St. George castles. Because, honestly, with the kind of scenario there in, in Wales and the distraction of Scotland and all the other things going on, you would honestly expect more of them to have had these human incidents. You would expect it to be far more common, more to have fallen than did. which testifies to the quality of the construction. It also testifies to the importance of sea power in them, because here is the point. What does that dock, that ability to be resupplied by sea, ultimately mean to the garrison? It means when they look at their food stockpile and their ammunition stockpile, 
and they see it dwindling, they still have hope. It means when they are looking around them and are possibly scared, they still think they have a means of escape. It also means that is all tied up with their holding onto the castle. So the castle becomes incredibly more important. Incredibly important, as it is already is, but incredibly important to their survival. Rather like a, the big ship is the safest place to be in an ocean storm. If you can keep your ship afloat, that is the safe, far safer place to be than the life raft. The same is true of the castle. A well-designed castle with the abilities that are put in the ring of iron. Stone, has features which mean that for the garrison, especially a garrison who are made up more often not of professional soldiers, and possibly retire, some retired professional soldiers who have now taken up trades, they know that is their best bet. And therefore protecting that becomes critically important. This doesn't mean all of them have good endings, though. And it's not just the slighting. Honestly, some of them are badly treated long before the slighting. When the period of castles is over and it's now becoming about armies in the field, or gunpowder. Well... That is when things get really interesting for castles and they stop being status symbols and weapons of war, machines of war which are protected and instead become resources as in we can break that up for resources lead, stone, dressed stone, always in high demand glass, wood all sorts of things from the car can be taken from a castle. Which is probably why so many of them disappear. The interesting thing I would say is how many of these castles A survive, but B continue to be used in some fashion for a very long time. And it speaks to the quality of design. Because the big issue I have with the period of apparently post castle when apparently it's now castles are being built for fashion rather than war is that I think it misses the point castles are still military important and if you're talking about places like Jersey, Anglesey, etc those castles matter security wise but what they're missing when they're saying all these things is the reality that with the change of warfare so does the car or so does the need and the desired positions of castles change you might need less castles but you still need to dominate strategic points that's why eventually star forts and other things come along because you need to dominate strategic points and trust me i have spent weeks going around wales i have spent last week going around jersey there are plenty of reasons to build a fortified position, and it it's a castle. Now, you might start differentiating, and I think this is more the point is that happens between the castle or the fort the places built for military purposes, which become forts, and the places built for civilian purposes, which become chateaus, estates, grand houses. And really, you can build the latter, i.e., devoid of its military a castle devoid of its military functions, when you have peace and stability. That is when you can build those. But usually, those are built when you still are building castles. And a number of those places, even the ones built up to the English Civil War and during the English Civil War, get 
suddenly turned into castles with walls and crenellations added because of the, thought of, uh, the fear of upcoming conflict. Edward I was building castles because he wanted stability. He was reacting to the events, and before anyone says, and uh, some commenters have said, well, Owen Gundair was right to be allying with the French, you know, that's his, the enemy against the, uh, against the English, and I agree, there is a logic from Owen's side, but there's also the problem that the moment he does, uh, it's his only option to seek out a strong enough ally who might help him fight the English. It's also the one thing he can do which is most likely to turn into a death match with the English. It's a catch-22. You can argue he might have been more sensible to have tried to seek out something from the Pope. But honestly, he doesn't have much of a chance. None of them do, in some respects. Not because England was a massive lumbering HGVs worth of populace going to crush them. Nothing so simple as that. Most of them are crushed by armies compro comprised majoritively or largely at least of Welsh. Their fellow Welsh. Who don't like them. They just don't like them. Sometimes they don't like them because of very seemingly petty reasons, but often they don't like them because often they the rebellious forces treat them as badly as they perceive the English having treated them. The rebellious forces treat the Welsh, who the rest of the Welsh, as badly as the rebellious forces perceived had the English have treated them. And they could quite honestly be correct about how the English have treated them. In fact, more than likely they are. Because, as I've said in many of the videos, there are no saints in this. There are no good people. If you're looking for good guys and bad guys, history is not a good place and not a place to start. I'm not going to keep saying good. It's just not. History is reality. There are not saints and sinners a whole lot. There are a couple who probably fit in the latter category, far less who would potentially fit in the former category. And even that's going to probably be highly subjective and perspective based. Vast majority of history is made up of shades of grey. They tend to edge towards the darker side of the shade, of the grey spectrum as well. But that's fine. That can teach us a lot. But that also then functions into a warfare and into the reality of these castles as constructs of sea power as well as land power. Because they are just constructs of power. They have civil power in them. They have royal power. They have military power. They have sea power. They have judicial power in some respects. 
all sorts of things get wrapped up into these castles, especially when they're combined with the towns and the access to the sea. All these things together make them very, very powerful points of interest. If you have a dock, you have a marketplace, you automatically become the centre of the local economy in this period. There are not many good docks, there are certainly not many safe marketplaces where merchants can bring their goods and feel they're going to be safe to sell them. You protect the roads on the way in and out. Wow, that becomes a very stabilizing factor. And the thing is, if merchants are able to trade for it fairly and wander around and freely, then people will be able to buy and sell those goods and buy and sell to the merchants and from the merchants. That helps them. That gives that makes them buy in. This is the point which needs to be considered when we're talking about these rebellions and we're talking about what happens. Why do so many Welsh actually support the English? Why do the English find it so easy relatively to go in? Yes, it's hard fighting. Trust me, Welsh are dogged warriors, but they can go in. Why? Because, honestly, those sites which Edward builds up provide stability, not only in terms of protection for, whatever, for England from Welsh attacks, but also provide stability for the locals. And that's ultimately the dirty secret of these things and of the power which castles, especially in this brand, provide. Stability, security, peace. And you don't need a huge garrison for that. You need enough of a garrison to make sure the castle is secure and isn't easy to be walked into and is well maintained. That's why when you when I was discussing the garrison strengths, there's carpenters, masons, all sorts of things on that garrison list who are nothing to do with fighting the castle, surely, but they're all to main, do with maintaining the castle. And those castles would have been painted, whitewashed regularly, so they were these visible gleaming symbols of power and status. Well, as long as the money was coming in. Ultimately, I would say, if anything undermined the castles in terms of Wales and their ability to do it, it, do what they're supposed to do, it's the lack of money to, kind of, to finish them off. I know some estimate that Maris was when £700 are being finished, and I said well, my estimate's roughly 1500 which would have taken up to 16500 A lot of money. But a finished by Maris would have been very, very useful. A finished by Maris would have been a powerful influence on it. A f completely up to snuff Harlech would have been a very useful tool. But the amounts of money spent were already colossal. Enormous. They, of course, Edward I, who was a strong king by, uh, by feudal medieval England standards, to have to do all sorts of things to centralise power and raise taxes. Those same reforms would cause tremendous trouble for Edward II, who in no way was prepared or capable of dealing with them. Um, a system which is entirely based on a king and only won't, runs well when the king really doesn't play favourites but acts as the firm arbiter who is prepared to stamp down hard on anyone who transgresses his rules no matter how much he likes them and be seen to do so 
is not a system which will work well when you have someone who goes, but he's my best friend. It's a lonely job being the boss. Which takes us back to the castles because, well, that's often a lonely role, isn't it? Not really. Not in terms of these castles Edward's building. Because, in many ways, he's building them in batches. We've got two batches and a final castle, Bomaris. But, in many ways, Bomaris has. Common. It had one way, it has Carnarvon, another. They're a team. And that's really the interesting thing about this whole castle construction program. And one of the reasons why we possibly look at them so much and so much is placed on them and imagined around them. It's rare that you have castles being built by the batch by a king. I'm not just going, I'd like to build a castle there. Now a couple of years going, I'd like to build a castle there. No, building, I'm going to build four castles. I'm going to build five castles. I'm going to build this castle. And they're all within distance of each other. The other interesting thing is the amount of people who put stress evolution in terms of the designs. Uh, they treat these designs as evolutions, as Master James and George evolving the design and slowly developing along with Edward to the point to which Bomaris comes into existence. I disagree with that completely. Look at the sites. He is designing the best castle he can for the site on the budget he has allocated. Because it depends on what castle you're going to build and the quality of the castle depends upon, of course, location, but also what do you want that castle for, what's it going to do, how much you prepared to pay, and how much time you have to build it. Bomaris starts to get built very quickly but thanks to its location and initial funds and initial numbers. But it's not really the quickest build. I would say Flint goes up much quicker and you can see the design differences between Bomaris and Flint. Flint is designed around a central tower almost which will defend everything and therefore a very small garrison can slowly retreat, retreat and retreat into it and still hold it and still dominate the castle from that central point, which, by the way, they can still get away from. But Maris is a very different setup. But Maris has a town. But Maris is on an island all on its own. You don't want to retreat until you have to. You want a big moat. You want to, though, buy time in other ways. If they go for a get over the moat, they then have to get over the, uh, the outer wall. They get onto the outer wall, they're being fired up from the inner wall. So they have to push on, they have to find a way into the inner ward. And that's still a nightmare because then you have to fight your way through everything to get anywhere you want to go. It's atrocious in terms of the obstacle facing you to try and take Bomaris if it's completed. Even not completed, it's still a nightmare. Castles, in terms of their design and warfighting, are about sacrificing enemy lives to gain you time. Broadly speaking. And what's even more amazing is when you see how uh, the tools they used to build them. They didn't have any of the huge cranes we take for granted today, you know, the huge piece of machinery. They're using wood, they're using block and tackle, they're using 
occasionally, possibly, ox-powered or human-powered cranes. It's amazing what they do. Ramps are quite common. Scaffolding, all sorts of wooden posts are stuck in the con are, st are put into the wall and to provide them with the layers going up and up and up. But again, it all comes down to what you want from the castle you're building and where it's going to be built. So summary. There's another photo of mine of Bomaris. The Ring of Stone. Far better than the Ring of Iron. Although I'm still surprised I don't call it the Iron Ring. But there was a big controversy a couple of years ago. Oh, a bit further possibly. My brain might be lying to me. About plans to build a giant Iron Ring to walk around as it being too on the nose. Yeah, it could have been a cool tourist attraction. I have a feeling no one is currently alive who was involved in these things, so I'm not sure why anyone's saying that, but if it upsets people, it upsets people. And it shouldn't, you know, you don't deal with things if you're going to upset people. It's not what governments prefer to do. Prefer to win your, boats, uh, win your votes by making you happy, or at least think you're supposed to be happy. That's me being cynical. These are an amazing example of sea power. These castles. Edward the First's ring of iron stone is an amazing example of sea power. What is interesting is that the next time you see a major royal castle building program it's Henry VIII's artillery forts being built around various harbours around the nation again able to be resupplied by sea very important but also to dominate harbours so that people can't get into them from the sea. Next generation after that of big construction? Well, are of course the Martello Towers. Sorry, I forgot. Martello for a second now. For Britain, sea power and castles are tremendously interwoven. They are tremendously interlinked and they are a factor in our history. Therefore, they're a factor in everyone's history. In Britain. especially when it's talking about batch building of fortifications when you're talking about building a large number of forts a large number of castles a large number of towers more often than not it's sea power and this goes back further than just Edward I let's be honest why is Hadrian's Wall anchored on the coast on both sides because you can dominate it, but also you can supply it. You can supply those big bases either this side, thanks to the sea. So, next time you're wandering around castles, ask yourself, please, for me, Five questions. Who built this castle? And who were they? 
who constructed this castle. Why is it where it is? And why is it as it is? There is no sliding sale of this thing's a castle, this isn't a castle, this is a semi castle. Things are ever a castle, or and things are ever a castle, or they're not. Hence my opinion on Bodium Castle. It's a castle, it's appropriate to its time. It's not designed to fight a major army because the lord who built Bodium wasn't expecting to have a major army come and fight him. If he did, something had gone really, really badly wrong. It's supposed to be able to deter raiders and minor aggressors. And they'll do fine. Castles which are built by kings, as I said, are built to deter a lot more. But who can say, uh, who builds the castle? And who were they? You are know, the most important questions. Because is it an earl? Is it a king? Is it a lord? Is it a knight? And who were they as a person? Have they been off on crusade? Have they been fighting in the Holy Land? Have they been fighting at home? Are they someone who's made their money through commercial means or war fighting? All these things will affect the the place they want to live. and the place they want to build and how much money they're prepared to put towards the castle is this one of many castles or is this their only one that's also another good one where do they have lands do they have any decent really decent sites for a castle that can be a problem I don't know most of all though go visit some castles and forts they have been suffering a lot in COVID. A lot of history sites have been suffering a lot in COVID. And they need your support, and they're a great day out. Thank you for watching. I hope you've liked these videos. If you have, please consider sharing them. If you do subscribe and share them, that really does help with the YouTube and its lovely uh, logarithms and making these things more visible to people so anything you can do on that is great and um, especially apparently if you, if you post them to Twitter and those sort of things it picks up on it somehow I don't know but it's interesting and um, thank you very much I'll be available to answer questions at some point and I'll possibly do a live on castles at some point so you can all grill me thank you very much and take care